Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's program, Data-Driven Innovations and in Infrastructure and Asset Management, brought to you by Trimble. I'm Aaron Heffron, President of Insights and Forecasting here at GovExec, and I'm excited today for this conversation and the guests that have we have brought together. From roads to water and barracks and dining halls and really infrastructure that makes our military go, the U.S. Department of Defense and each of the service branches really manages a tremendous amount of assets, many things that keep us going in the infrastructure side and the utility side of things. Not only the installation, but the maintenance of these uh, assets is really a critical component of the DOD's ability to create and sustain mission readiness going forward. A lot has been done, there's a lot of innovation and data and analytics has become part of that whole equation. And now DOD can leverage new and emerging technologies to effectively manage this installation and the maintenance projects that come after it and make data-driven funding decisions. To that end, I have two great guests today who really are on the front line, so to speak, of this both within the Air Force and in the Navy. And I want to welcome our panelists today. First is Rear Admiral Dean Vanderlei, who's the Commander of Naval Facilities and Engineering Systems and the Chief of Civil Engineers for the U.S. Navy. And Major General John Allen, Commander of the Air Force Installation and Mission Support Center at the U.S. Air Force. Thank you and welcome, gentlemen. Thanks, Aaron. Good to be here. Excellent. And so let's just start off rather than me doing an introduction and explaining uh, what you all do. Um, you know, Admiral Vanderlei, let me start with you. Uh, tell me a little bit about your role and the approach and your general philosophy on managing that kind of infrastructure uh, that we just discussed. Yeah, well, thanks, Aaron, for the kind introduction as well as for uh, for having me here today. So, so as the commander of NAFAC, you, generally, I'm responsible for the planning, design, um, construction, and maintenance of shore infrastructure uh, for the Navy and the Marine Corps around the world. Um, additionally, as one of the of one of the one of DoD's design and construction agents, also responsible for um, design construction for all the services in certain locations, such as in the Pacific. Um, and you know, although my focus probably is most significantly on the delivery of specific maintenance and construction projects, there's also a broader responsibility for things like cybersecurity, environmental, um, even, even uh, some work on the seashore. So a, a fairly broad area of responsibility and a lot of opportunity, though, you know, for innovation as well as uh, using data. And so I know that's what we're talking about today. That's one of my focus areas as we you know, really look at how we can best support the warfighter with infrastructure. Um, so yeah, a lot of opportunities and uh, thank you so much for having me. Great. And uh, General Allen, how is your, what is your perspective and how may, is it similar or different? Yeah, th thanks Aaron. Um, so maybe a little, little different. Um, um, I, I guess I'll start by talking about my organization just, just real quickly. Um, in the Air Force, our installations are power projection platforms. That's something that we we uh, focus on uh, considerably. Um, they are the places where we build our readiness, the places we deploy readiness to where it needs to be, and, and they're also more and more often the places from where we employ readiness. So, so the condition of that um, land and built infrastructure that make those installations is very important to us. They're also um, really just land and buildings without the combat support and combat service support units that, that make them operate as power projection platforms. So my organization um, kind of lives in between um, the Pentagon and the headquarters Air Force and, and, and headquarters Space Force where they're making um, policy and strategy and resourcing decisions and at our installations where our uh, mission support groups at those at those installations are delivering a lot of um, mission support and installation support. We do programming, so we deal with a lot of requirements. 
Um, we manage um, the, the execution year, as we say, when, when money is appropriated by Congress and sent to us, the dollars that, that resource all of that installation emission support flow through my organization and go to the field. And then I do have uh, primary subordinate units that focus on uh, program management across nine different installation support functions. So um, perhaps more like uh, the Navy's scenic uh, and the Army's MCOM than, than, uh, than uh, Admiral Vandalay's NAFAC or, or the Army Corps. Um, but, but asset management is kind of where we live, right? Because we are dealing in requirements and um, we don't have the resources that we would like to have. So we, we have to, to understand the physical plant and, and the mission support portfolio to ensure that we're putting the resources that we do have in the right place across the enterprise. So big deal for uh, us. Must be quite, quite the challenge, uh, you know, talking about nine different functions and, and going across there in that asset management. What are really your, you know, if you had to pick two or three main challenges in trying to do that as efficiently and effectively, you mentioned just resources in general, but are there other things that affect that, you know, for me, for you on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I would say resourcing is a challenge. Um, and so we are constantly trying to um, advocate for the resources that we need to support the missions that are out there. Um, and the best way to do that is to understand the portfolio, right? In our case, understand the physical plant and understand the, the, the training and equipping of the units that, that deliver a lot of those installation support functions out in the field. So um, I, I think most of our challenges, I would say, centered around data, having the right data, having high data quality and sustaining that data quality um, in a way that um, doesn't require, or, or, or perhaps more and more moving into the future requires less individual human touch um, so that those humans can be focused on um, making decisions based on the, what the data is telling us versus just gathering it and sustaining it. That makes sense. I, I, that's a considerable challenge for us. Sure. Um, Admiral, is it the same for you? Is is data that challenge, or are there other things along with it? Um, you, you know, data certainly is a challenge, really an enabler, I think, to get to get after you know what are my real significant challenges. Um, so for me, you know, the Navy and the Marine Corps are making some significant um, investments in shore infrastructure, and what that drives for me is a, a very significant workload. So you know, last year, for instance, we awarded over fifteen billion dollars in contracts, um, that, that was the most we've ever done. And a lot of, not only the volume, but also a complexity of work um, that's, that's really unprecedented, building new dry docks, multi-billion dollar projects that, that drive a complexity that's, that's a challenge for us. Um, you know, another challenge has to do with um, how we, um, how are we gonna do that, you know, in crisis and conflict? So, you know, we're, we're probably, you know, talking primarily about you know, our shore infrastructure here in, in peacetime. But, you know, ultimately in crisis and conflict, I have the same responsibilities and not only in established installations, but also in, uh, you know, places that aren't in installations, for instance, like remote islands across the Pacific. So, you know, that's, that's a upcoming challenge and a challenge that we're planning for. And then the third area that's a big challenge for us is, is the people side of it. So, you know, really almost a national issue, but, you know, I, I employ, you know, 20,000 folks, most of them technical professionals, both craftsmen, as well as engineers and, and other technical professionals. You know, that, the, the days where they just come knocking on my door, waiting to come to work is not the way things work anymore. So, you know, we're actively going out and, and uh, trying to, you know, attract and retain those technical professionals and, and develop them ourselves. You know, historically, you know, the private sector was kind of our farm team. You know, they would develop technical professionals. I would then hire them. That doesn't work anymore. I got to really get out there and, and bring in the young interns and then develop them myself. So those are some of the significant, you know, challenges I face. And then I see data and innovation as a way to be better and provide more value while getting after 
after those priorities and challenges. I can see that as you know, as an enabler there, especially in the uh, the situations you have. General, when you hear uh, talking about that crisis and conflict side of things, how does the infrastructure management, asset management, play toward you know ensuring you know mission success in kind of those areas? Like what you know, can you give me an example or talk about how? one helps the other being able to manage that such stuff successfully helps in that ultimate mission accomplishment uh sure so thinking about today's crisis you know the air force it's it's been in um it's been in the press lately the air force is uh, led by our secretary thinking about um, re-optimizing for great power competition and a, and a part of that is our our are our um, units of action set up for that great power competition relative to what we've been asked to do as, as an Air Force, you know, looking back the last 20 years. And, and at some point that conversation involves um, combat support and combat service support units and how are they best um, prepared, organized, trained and equipped to um, be ready for um, this great power competition. And so it's, it's while it's not a built infrastructure um, asset management challenge, it's an, it's an asset management challenge nevertheless, right? We have to understand um, uh, clearly what we have and what are the, more, more importantly, what are the effects of repurposing uh, some of these airmen to do something different than they're doing today? Uh, a lot of which are delivering installation support to um, to our installations around the world. Um, if they have to be pulled aside to, to focus on another mission, what are the effects of that? And then how do we understand uh, when we are when we have hit a red line in terms of what is a critical level of service that we are no longer providing? Whether that is for sustaining built infrastructure in Garrison, or whether that is you know, securing the perimeter at, a, at an installation somewhere. So um, I, I, I would say that's where they, they connect, right? And in order to um, make good decisions in that space, you really do need to understand condition of uh, built infrastructure. So the probability of failure, and you need to understand the consequence of failure, which is more mission dependency. Um, and Doing that across the uh, you know an enterprise with a four hundred billion dollar physical plant uh, um, is a challenge, no doubt. I can imagine, you know, Admiral, the connection between the work that you're doing and the ultimate mission um, you want to accomplish. You kind of divided it between you know what's going on domestically, what's also happening in conflict. Where where is that junction point, and what are some of the places where the connection is great? the enable is great and where are is it a little more tenuous and a little bit more of a challenge um so first of all i would say that you know everything i do is ultimately connected to uh you know fighting and winning our nation's wars right so sure. that's why i wear the uniform that's why you know you know john and i both wear the uniform because ultimately there is that connection um you know when it comes to shore infrastructure you know historically maybe there's been some challenge with making that connection but but frankly, the way we see it today, it's pretty seamless. So, you know, although the Navy and the Marine Corps pride ourselves on being, we, you know, we call it being our nation's away team, you know, that, you know, we, we ship sail away, the Marines deploy, but all that starts on a, sh on a shore infrastructure. So, you know, so everything that I do to construct and maintain shore infrastructure is directly connected to ultimately our ability to, to project power where it needs to be projected. Um, I did mention, you know, I also am, am directly connected to work that is done in a more expeditionary environment um, to include supporting expeditionary forces. So I am also um, the one who, who not only procures equipment for those expeditionary forces, but also provides uh, technical support, particularly for the CBs um, who, who I have a connection to. So then we all, I also have that direct connection as well. But frankly, all that I do, whether it's, you know, an established shore infrastructure or, or, you know, in a more expeditionary environment, is ultimately directly connected to the war fighter and war fighting. Sure, and you've allowed me to give a shout out to my father-in-law, CB. Um, Hoorah. That's great. Uh, well, uh, that's you know interesting. And you talked about 
data and analytics for you are more of an, an enabler and helping. So how, so where does that come into play in the, uh, as you're making decisions or uh, trying to uh, move things forward? Yeah, so, you know, everything I do, you know, constant improvement is, you know, I think a hallmark for, for you know, both John and I, they're always looking at how we can be better. You know, for me, when it comes to delivering construction, you know, it's how, how can I do it better, you know, faster and less expensive? And there's a lot of opportunity in the data environment to do that. And I'll, you know, I'll just give you a few examples. You know, within design, um, when we look at AI or machine learning, you know, which is ultimately all built on data, you know, construction design is ultimately a very rule, rules-based sort of activity. And so you can envision, and frankly, industry is right now envisioning what that might look like, where can we utilize um, an AI environment that can take broad parameters and deliver a construction design, which ultimately for me, you know, when we're, when we figure that out and it's being figured out right now, that's going to result in being delivered, being able to deliver construction designs, you know, ultimately better, faster, and less expensive in construction constructions, you know, very, very expensive. I hear about that all the time. You probably experienced that in your day-to-day -day life. There's been a lot of inflation in construction over the, over the past few years in particular. Um, how can that be industrialized? And being able to don, you know, again, using data, um, using AI, how can we, you know, do it in a modular way um, that allows us to, again, deliver construction better and less expensive. So there's just a couple quick examples, even within what I do, you know, I also maintain our shore infrastructure. So I have things like smart grids for utilities um, that delivers a lot of data. Um, how can I better utilize that data for things like condition-based maintenance? for anticipating what my energy requirements are and then driving down how to minimize those energy requirements and be more effective, efficient, and resilient. So tons of opportunity, I can go on and on, but, but you know, I just see a ton of opportunity for utilizing data and really all, you know, taking the next step into machine learning and AI to, to deliver what I do you know, better, faster, and less expensive. So thinking about those analytics and data, Admiral, there are a lot of other new technologies that are on the horizon of things to come. What are the things that you're most excited about? I mean, maybe they're not realized yet, but what are you excited about going forward? You know, one, one of them I just spoke to. So, so the ability to utilize um, data and, uh, and really enhanced um, capabilities in AI to do engineering design, I think is very, very exciting. Um, in maintenance, you know, I talked a little bit about this too, but we, again, we have a tremendous amount of data and we have the ability to collect even more, but then how do I leverage that to actually make a difference in the efficiency of my workforce? How can I best connect them to that data to understand, you know, again, instead of just, you know, changing an air filter every, every uh, six months, how can I understand when I really need to do it based on, based on conditions and based on the data I have? So for me, it's, it's taking the data that we do have, organizing it better. So, you know, another significant aspect, I have a ton of data that's, you know, historically not been centralized in a way that it's super useful. And so what we've been doing is, is moving that data into an enter enterprise data warehouse so that I have one you know, place to get my data and then moving that to the cloud so that we can access it in an efficient and effective way. So that's one aspect of just organizing my da data in a way that's helpful. But then I think, you know, the real place that really excites me is then how can I leverage that data to be more effective and how can I, you know, it's one thing to have data, but what I'm really excited about is how I can use that to return efficiency and effectiveness. And we're doing that now, but I think there's just so much opportunity to be um, that much better when it comes to making making my workforce out there all the more effective. That's great. And General Allen, you know, the data and the importance of data is something that you brought up early on. I mean, it was one of the first things you mentioned and, you know, that has opportunities and such. Talk a little bit about how you're using that data and what that means for you. It sounds less like the engineering construction side of things and more about 
knowing what you have in supply chain and logistics. Um, am I getting that right? Yeah, Aaron, thank you. Um, you, you're, you are getting it right. So from my position, uh, it's about sequencing the requirements. Um, well, I, let me back up. It's about deciding which requirements are going to be above the funding line and below the funding line and then sequencing them in programming so that we can partner with, you know, Dean and our, and our teammates at the Army Corps, uh, who does most of our capital um, uh, investment uh, in, in built infrastructure for us. Um, so I, I'll give you an example. I, I have um, an issue that we're working right now where I, I have a runway that needs to be repaired um, just in time to support uh, a new weapon system bed down at this installation. And right now that requirement um, is unfortunately below the funding line where, where the funding line sits for the year we're talking about. And so I have to now um, make a decision on whether or not we're going to move that up and displace a considerable number of other requirements elsewhere around the enterprise. Um, and so, you know, we can certainly um, make those decisions based on our gut. That's not really how we like to do that, though. It needs to be um, data informed. And again, everything, everything uh, kind of revolves around uh, the, what is the consequence of, of, of failure if, if we fail to invest in this, um, in this requirement and what's the probability of failure if we fail to invest in the requirement. So, you know, these are, these are the kinds of conversations we have almost daily as we're trying to figure out um, how, to, how to sequence the timing of resourcing so that we give our teammates at NAFAC and the Army Corps enough time to, to help us deliver the actual construction. Uh, hopefully that helps. So as you're trying to leverage data, there's a lot of new technologies and, and other things that may be either near term or on the horizon that I'm sure you've heard about or, or ways to manipulate and use the information and analytics. Are there some particular things, particular technologies that you're looking forward to? Like, hey, I really can't wait until X is able to happen for us. Um. I, I like to think that we are staying connected to industry so that we, we are aware of the things that we should be looking forward to, right? I, I would like to um, be constantly proactive and understanding condition of built infrastructure so that we're talking about the sustainment uh, activity before it breaks, not after it breaks. Um, and I think there's a lot. Um, I think there's a lot going on in that space. I know there's a lot going on in that space to help us, you know, just understand, uh, you know, building infrastructure systems, for example, that might be um, that might be close to failure, and 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 you wouldn't otherwise know it until it happens. Um, a lot of we we're doing a lot of this work um, uh, as we rebuild um, Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida. Um, which got hit by Hurricane Michael uh, in, in October of 2018. Um, and, and I'm encouraged by um, the partnership that we've been able to forge with industry um, through AFWorks and through DIU, where we've asked, you know, basically said we want to build back the installation of the future here, bring us your great ideas, and then some of those we've been able to put in place. Um, the other thing that we had, we we're, we're very focused on in that regard is when we, when we bring these great sensors in to help us understand what's happening with built infrastructure, we got to make sure that we're doing that in a way that's cyber secure. So there's a lot obviously happening in the cybersecurity space. Um, that helps us um, not only make sure all these sensors are cyber secure, but that, that we're able to process what those sensors are telling us in a way that it's not, you know, one airman in, a, in, a, in an operations center looking at 10 or 15 different screens, but rather uh, looking at one screen and all of those sensors are, are able to feed um, that one screen. And that's a, that's a, still a, I think a challenge across um, not just the military, but across the industry. Yeah, I would agree. I hear a lot about uh, in talking with other folks like yourself about predictive maintenance and the, you know, really understanding and, and the application and use of sensors, both here and abroad of setting, you know, forward, uh, forward areas and really understanding what's going on there. So Admiral, as you are looking toward 
those new areas of using the data, using analytics, using technologies, what are the main challenges that keep you from just rolling forward? And I'll say you're going to have to set funding aside. Um, other than the dollars, what are some of the challenges that you you face? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I don't think even if I could blame the dollars, I don't think I could blame it because I don't think that's ultimately typically the issue. You know, General Allen hit one of them security. So whether it's you know cybersecurity, national security, whatever. When it comes to managing data, there's always that challenge of how do we you know put the right security protocols in place in a way that doesn't hamper our ability to exchange data. You know, data is great, but if you can't exchange it with the right folks, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good. And even when it comes to using you know, some of the more exquisite tools that where that takes that data and actually implements it, you know, being, you know sometimes our own IT security um, makes that difficult. So, you know, that's probably one of the most difficult challenges we have with, with implementing innovation has to do with, with the security protocols. The second area I would say is, you know, General Allen also brought up the industry engagement. So ultimately, you know, most of the, obviously most of the innovation we see is being is being developed in industry. So the only way that we're going to be able to leverage that is by a close connection to industry. So how can I best incentivize industry to bring their best in, in innovation to the fore? You know, when working with me, and you know, kind of along those same lines, what do I need to do to ensure that I'm not putting in you know some sort of bureaucratic um, roadblocks that really prevent them from bringing their best. So those are really, I think the two challenges that I have is really how to, how to work through the different security protocols that are out there, as well as how can I best engage and empower industry to bring their best um, when it comes to data and innovation. General Allen, I saw you nodding and such on, on many of these uh, points that were made. You know, what was it that resonated there? Is it the security or what are the challenges that you see um, or speed bumps, let's say, on the way to getting this done? Yeah, all of it resonated with me. In particular, you probably saw my head nod when Dean was talking about um, um, security of our own systems. You know, we have, um, I would say, no shortage of really interesting technologies um, that we're, we're seeing from industry um, but uh, it is not an easy thing to get an authority to operate those systems necessarily um, on our on our on our government systems. You know, and all, all very well intentioned. It's it's kind of a fact of life, and I think there's some things that you know we can do in partnership with industry to maybe um, get better at this, and we're already seeing it. Um, I'm excited about the potential for artificial intelligence. Um, uh, because from my vantage point, um, the, the, in, the intensity of the workload to un understand, ensure quality of, to, to generally manage data, and then to bring that data to make risk-based, risk-informed decisions is pretty human intensive. Um, and we've, we've had some success um, leveraging artificial intelligence just in kind of the annual management of the property book, which is an important part of, you know, what, what my organization does because it's, it's the root of how we advocate for resourcing. And if that property book is, is out of compliance or not auditable, um, then that's a problem. And I, and I think there's a lot of opportunity um, for us to... to onboard AI um, analytic tools that, that take us right up to the point where the, the human needs to step in and, and, and for something inherently governmental and understand, understand the, the data and, and, and inform and make their decision recommendations. So I'm excited about that, but uh, yeah, I think, I think Admiral Vanderlei hit a, a lot of challenges that, that we share. Yeah, so I, you know, a lot of the folks that are going to be watching this, you know, come from the industry industry perspective and are looking for ways that industry itself can help in these partnerships. 
what are the what are the things that you look more toward these partnerships, uh, General Allen, in helping you? You know, what is it that you can be brought to the table that either you're getting now and that's great, do more of that, or hey, we're not getting enough of this. Can somebody step up and help? Um, I think the thing that I would ask for the help on is, you know, talk a little bit about how we think about innovation and in, in the built infrastructure space in the Air Force. You know, a lot of a lot of the innovation that we need is happening down at our installations in civil engineer squadrons that are managing the built infrastructure there, and they may need a thing. And they, they have the authorities delegated down to commanders in the field to engage with industry and they have some, some resourcing to, to go out and seek that thing. And as my bosses want to say, you know, don't try to manage entropy, right? Just let that happen. That's good. There are some things, however, um, that, are, that are best, the, the innovation for which is best done in a more centralized way because we don't want different versions of the tool, right, um, that, are, that are fielded across the enterprise. So there's a balance there. Um, what will be most helpful to us is if the things that industry is bringing that are helping our, at our, at a, a, on a tactical problem at an installation level can talk to and feed the central data lakes and analytic tools that, we're, that we rely on uh, in order to, to make good um, centralized, you know, enterprise programming and resourcing decisions. So that connection is important. Uh, Admiral, you mentioned similarly that you're you know, anxiously look toward partners and to help uh, go forward. Kind of same question to you. Are there things that you're getting now that you said, hey, do more of that? or And are there gaps that uh, the industry can help step forward? Yeah, where, where I think industry could really help is kind of the application. So I do, I do, you know, I think industry engagement is very important. I do a lot of it. So I've got a decent sense as to where industry is going, what is the art of the possible, and, and where things are moving. Um, so then being able to take that and apply it to what we do, what I do, what we do day to day, and then ultimately to create you know, value when it comes to, you know, I mentioned from the, at the beginning, you know, I live, I live every day by how to improve cost, how to improve schedule and how to improve quality. And so that connection between the art of the possible and where we're at with data and innovation to applying it to what we're doing and then ultimately delivering in improvements in cost schedule and, uh, and quality and capability. You know, that's, that's where my head's at. And that's where I'm really focused in is how I can, how I can move that, you know, I'm an engineer, so I'm inherently pragmatic, right? I want to know what does this do for me? And that's, so that's where, you know, the and, and industry is working on that, right? So they're, I don't want to act like they're out there oblivious. They're working hard with us, but that's really where uh, I think we need to focus. Well, in the interest of being pragmatic, I'm going to kind of wrap up here with one more question here in the, in the interest of time. And I'll start with you, General. You know, looking ahead, um, there's a number of strategic initiatives or priorities that you probably are focusing on going forward. You know, what are one or two of those longer term perspectives that you have from a priority perspective that you're going to be leaning into over the coming years that we should all keep in the back of our minds? I, I think... Um... I think artificial intelligence is where how I would answer that question. I mean, there are a lot of areas, but that would be one. Not only how I've discussed it, where, where I've said it helps us with our uh, analytic ability, but there are there are ways there are there are AI tools out there that allow us to do things um, in an automated way that don't involve a person. Um, and you know, as I'm thinking about great power competition for our Air Force. Um, you know, how do I do things at a forward location on a small island in the Pacific with about, uh, you know, 25% of the people that I thought about using when I was when I was thinking about doing that work in the in the late 80s and the 90s. Um, and I think there's a role for um, uh, AI there that that is very important to us. So we're, we're looking at all of that. 
And Admiral Vanderlei, your thoughts, kind of the priorities for you, kind of strategic priorities going forward, one or two of those that are kind of some parting thoughts for you. Sure. So, so where I look is I look at where do I think is the, the most opportunity? Where do I think the leverage is going to be the greatest? And so in, in business and in the work I do, the, a good amount of the resources I get are associated with construction. And construction, honestly, is, is an industry that hasn't changed as much over the last couple hundred years as, as you might think. There's obviously some things that are different, but you know, in many cases, it's done pretty similarly to the way it was done 50 or 100 years ago. So I just think there's a ton of opportunity there. I talked about how much construction costs. So you know, I look at the industrialization of construction as a huge area of opportunity where I think that there, um, we can make a difference. Um, also in engineering and maintenance. So we've talked about a lot of those, but again, we spend a lot of, uh, a lot of money on engineering and in maintenance, where again, we don't do it that much differently now than we did it 50 or 100 years ago. And industry is right there. I, I feel like we're right on the cusp of really making some breakthroughs that are really going to make a difference. So, so my priorities are, are where I see the opportunity, and I see it in construction, engineering, and maintenance, where there's a lot of opportunity. And I feel like, again, we're on the cusp of some breakthroughs, and that's where I, that's where I want to see us make a difference. That's great. And I, I really appreciate you both taking the time today uh, to discuss this. Thank you to General Allen. Thank you to Admiral Vandelay for sharing your insights about innovation, where we're going, and the ways that you're trying to improve uh, the asset management and operational efficiencies that you have, both yourselves and in partnership with industry in general. Stay tuned, everybody. This isn't the end of our conversation. We're going to be right back uh, to continue uh, the conversation on asset management and a little more look at the data and analytics side of things with Chris Bell, VP of Industry Strategy at Trimble. Welcome to the second part of today's program, Data-Driven Innovations in Infrastructure and Management, presented by Trimble. I'm Susan Rose, Senior Director of Insights and Content at GovExec. I am really excited to continue today's conversation about how DOD can leverage new and emerging technologies to efficiently manage installation and maintenance projects with Chris Bell, the VP of Industry Strategy from Trimble. Chris, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Susan, and thanks for having me on this program. Um, let me give you just a quick little background. Uh, I am the uh, Vice President of Industry Strategy at a technology organization uh, called Trimble. And what we do is we serve uh, agencies and the Department of Defense with uh, technology in location, geospatial uh, survey, as well as enterprise applications in both project management, as well as enterprise asset management. Wonderful. So tell us, how do you approach managing infrastructure and utilities assets in that role? Yeah, so um, first of all, uh, our role is a supportive role. Uh, we help organizations uh, to be prepared. Um, so uh, for us, it's uh, all about readiness and making sure that uh, information is accessible uh, for both the, the design and construction of new assets, as well as the operations and maintenance of those existing assets. Um, so we're really focused on readiness. The other part that I would add to that is, um, is this uh, approach to stewardship. Um, you certainly have heard uh, that uh, we're all in this condition of, of constrained resources and trying to do more with less. Uh, stewardship is one of those ways to make sure that we're uh, getting uh, all the productivity that we can uh, and making sure that uh, um, we reserve uh, all of the, uh, uh, the budget uh, towards the mission, uh, as much of the mission as possible. And as you can imagine, these things are very critical to mission success. So can you elaborate on that just a little bit more for us? Yeah, uh, so mission success is uh, certainly defined by the agency that is uh, in charge of that mission. Uh, and, uh, and when you think about this sort of category, uh, the, um, uh, both uh, Re Rear Admiral uh, Vanderlei and uh, uh, Major General uh, Allen, they both spoke about both the design and construction side of, um, of 
making sure that we've got uh, um, the support for the missions and then the asset management side of existing and built assets. Uh, and so um, our role uh, is to provide technology to allow them to do that efficiently. So can you expand on that a little bit and tell us about specifically some of the challenges that your clients are facing for uh, managing these assets? Yes, uh, um, uh, consistent with, again, what was shared earlier is that we often hear um, uh, about challenges in the accessibility and, uh, and visibility to the data that they need to be both good stewards and uh, operate at a high level of readiness. Uh, and so uh, we've sort of coined a term uh, that really speaks to that, uh, and it's, uh, it's called dark data. Uh, and let me give you an example of, of what dark data is, is about. Um, we've worked with uh, many, many agencies, and one agency in particular shared a, a lament, if you will, is uh, they commissioned a, a pretty large project, and uh, it was a design and construction of, a, of an asset. Uh, and um, one of the requirements for the delivery of that project was to hand off what are called as built. Um, these are the final uh, design uh, and construction documents. Lots of things change during uh, an, an on site design and construction of a project. And when that asset is delivered uh, for uh, asset management or operations and maintenance teams, um, you need to have the right amount of data uh, that is accurate to what was finally built. Well, here's the uh, a really uh, a the big challenge when that information was handed over it came in the form of three shipping containers filled with banker boxes of paper and a 10 gigabyte or a terabyte hard drive full of uh, um of like undeterminable files uh, and that officially complied with the as built delivery all documentation was there so we don't, I wouldn't say we have a data problem per se, because the data was delivered. Um, it's a uh, format, organization, and accessibility. Uh, it took that agency two years and 30 people to try to get all of that data into their asset management system, and their capture rate was only 10%. So after two years, 10% of that data was usable uh, by that agency. Wow, that's uh, that's crazy. That kind of segues really well into the next question I wanted to ask you. Uh, and and I, given what you just told us, I'm not sure <laughs> what the answer to this is, but what kind of technologies, what kind of new things coming on the horizon might help with issues like that? Because you can't, like you said, you can't even really get into analyzing the data and do anything with it when it's in bankers boxes in a couple of container ships. So is there anything coming along that might help with that or other technologies that are really going to help support uh, the mission in terms of this asset management? For sure, um, it, you know, for the um, for the two patriots that spoke earlier, they spoke about having responsibilities for the entire life cycle, and I think that's really important. Uh, the world has traditionally seen capital projects and maintenance as two separate functions and organizations, and the support of technology has been really uh, a departmental based approach. And what we're seeing is really a new trend uh, that is emerging, which is to take a life cycle based approach. So the major phases of an asset are the design, the construction, the operations and the maintenance. And um, it's important to think about it from a life cycle perspective, because here's the uh, important statistic. 75% of the total cost of ownership of an asset is it is incurred the 30 years after the asset is designed and built, right? So um, most of your cost is in operations and maintenance. And so when you have inefficiency in operations and maintenance, it actually robs your ability to do all of the capital projects, which are um, all the new missions and support and the new things that, um, that uh, our soldiers need. So, um, 
the the trend that organizations are taking now is this asset life cycle management approach ALM and the idea is to really think about um, uh, this technology uh, for project delivery design and construction and um, and uh, enterprise asset management or operations and maintenance as really one thing is that these things should work together and when they do, they actually eliminate that handoff challenge that I spoke about, is if you could only capture 10% of that data, why? Well, it's because the format and the data are all different, and they're different teams, and they're handing stuff off to one another. What if you took the handoffs away, and you could flow that data across the life cycle? That's, that's where the efficiency is going to come from. Yeah, and that would certainly address some of the challenges there. Uh, but realistically, there's still going to be some challenges with adopting this approach. So what are some of the challenges that you see and, and what preemptively do you think uh, the DoD can do to minimize those or to, you know, to get ahead of this uh, ALM issue? situation. <laughs> sure, sure. So um, the first is uh, is really a, uh, not a ton about uh, technology. It's really is an approach. Um, I've heard uh, some agencies really uh, speak of the idea of starting with the end in mind. So um, what that means to me as a, as a technology person is that uh, that is an asset centric approach. Uh, and it's also um, a GIS-centric approach. Where are my assets physically on, uh, in the globe and on a map? And, um, and do I understand uh, the assets that are being created? Now, if you can move that sort of philosophy all the way up to design and construction, you can begin to request information to be organized in the way that it will be used for 75% of its life cycle. Um, so um, that is uh, one of the first and foremost. It's about leadership and setting expectations with the uh, suppliers and vendors that, uh, uh, that serve uh, the agencies. Uh, and then of course, the technology. Uh, the technology does have to have um, a way in which uh, to share information uh, and to um, reference uh, uh, the data that you need uh, in something that's more central. Yeah, there's that feels like a simple yet kind of complicated process. So how are you partnering with government and DOD to bring, you know, to start from the end of mind and to bring this asset asset centric approach into play and really help that get off the ground quickly so they can get on with innovating? And yeah. Uh, great question. And uh, uh, first of all, let's let's talk about the ecosystem. Part of this is one is um, working uh, with uh, the Department of Defense to just understand uh, organizational design and what's important, um, what is uh, um, uh, costing uh, the agencies um, uh, the most in terms of um, some inefficiencies. Uh, and then uh, there's an ecosystem and, and uh, in the um, uh, earlier part of the webinar, uh, the gentleman had talked about um, uh, Esri as an example. So um, we're partnered, uh, Trimble is partnered with Esri and uh, um, we offer an enterprise asset management capability on top of Esri. So that is a GIS centric enterprise asset management and it really is a different, better model uh, for, uh, for managing assets. Um, the other side of that is also having that same GIS centricity uh, associated with uh, digital project delivery. So how you manage design documents and how you manage uh, uh, the construction process, um, all of that information being accessible uh, to the systems uh, across the entire asset lifecycle management um, uh, workflow. So again, it's uh, that that main technology uh, just needs to uh, to consider one another in terms of being connected. Uh, and uh, um, one of the things that I really am excited about uh, when I think about that technology is this idea of a connected data environment. Uh, 
um, sounds super fancy and uh, uh, and is exciting and uh, but uh, organizations like Esri, they're the they are the system of record, if you will, uh, for an asset. Um, and uh, there are other systems of record that um, that really need to reference that information. And so um, Esri, along with another technology that we offer um, as a connected data environment, allows the agencies to share uh, both design and construction and asset management uh, data like work orders and maintenance repairs and preventative maintenance uh, activity uh, into one central location. And that way um, you can, again, eliminate that, uh, you know, the shipping containers full of, uh, of paper uh, and that creates tremendous efficiency. Um, that's great. Uh, our time is flying by so quickly and we have time for one more question. So what I would like is for you to leave our audience with one key takeaway. Like if they take nothing else from this entire program today, what do you want them to have in their minds as they sign off and go about their day? Sure, sure. Um, I think uh, serving the, uh, the Department of Defense uh, takes uh, specialized expertise and you have to understand the concepts of of uh, mission and readiness uh, and uh, and also the security aspect of it. Uh, and so technology um, uh, that can be used in these environments need to comply uh, with uh, uh, certain uh, security uh, requirements such as FedRAMP. Uh, and so that's important that um, the technology is able to do that. Um, the gentleman spoke quite uh, often about uh, uh, the idea of artificial intelligence. Um, that's predicated on doing an amazing job of centralizing some of that data so that you can build great artificial intelligence models. And it's true, the industry is working on predictive and preventative maintenance uh, to analyze uh, instantaneously existing conditions so that you can be better stewards of the data. Well, that is fantastic. I think that's a nice note to leave everybody on with today. So thank you very much for being with us this afternoon, Chris, and showing sharing your insights um, on how you work with government and public-private partnerships and all of that wonderful uh, stories about shipping containers and how we can use data and analytics to streamline asset management. Uh, I think the future looks really interesting. Uh, so everybody, that concludes our program for today. Uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to Trimble for supporting this program and to thank all of you for tuning in today. Uh, this event is going to be available shortly for on-demand viewing, so you can share it with your colleagues and you can come back and re-watch and re-digest all of this great information. So for GovExec, I am Susan Rose, and we will see you again next time. <laughs>